Now, um, before I introduce Colin to the stage, I just wanted to point out, for those of you who are uh, with us now, uh, we have released the poll again from this first thing this morning. Um, I'll come back afterwards and have a look at that with you if you all want to go back to it, see if your opinion has actually changed in any positive or negative way since this morning. Um, be very interesting to see. Well, I'm here delighted to be able to um, introduce Colin Bell to the stage. Uh, Colin was one of the original founders of Wilderness Safaris, uh, obviously an iconic brand for the African travel industry. And then in 2005, uh, was then co-founder of Great Plains Conservation, another um, another massive brand for, for the continent. Um, a passionate conservationist. Uh, we've heard a lot today about conservation. An author of Africa's Finest. A man whose career has been based around providing sustainable tourism. And a man who coined, who coined the Green Safari model. So, um, Colin, welcome. It's been a few years since we've managed to get you here. But we got you here finally, even if it is in digital form. So, welcome. How's it, everybody? Hi, Matt. Hey, Colin. Well, look, thank you straight into it. Um, before we ask, obviously, about the current situation and how you're bearing up for that, um, tell us a little bit about your learnings uh, with, with building wilderness safaris. How did it start? How did it grow and become to what it was? Well, I was one of the luckiest people on the planet. I Straight after my very first lecture at university, which was Accounting 101, I realized I was in big trouble. And uh, <laughs> so when I finished my degree, which is in 76, um, I applied for a job and I ended up getting a safari job guide position in Botswana in 1977. It was just one of those lucky, lucky things. And uh, in those days, Botswana was nowhere. It was rough and ready. We had these old Series 3 Land Rovers. And if we wanted a cool beer, we used to chuck a whole lot of beers in our socks and let them dangle off our side mirrors. And that was it. But I had the pin, I had the ability to work for one of the worst bosses on the planet. And one of the great things is once you work for a tough boss, you really appreciate what you should be doing. And we, I, I partnered with probably the best guide I've ever met in Africa. I was so lucky to have such a great partner, a guy called Chris McIntyre who could make an 80-year-old, a 28-year-old, an 18-year-old, an 18-month-old all have the most perfect safari. So I think the first lesson I learned was partner with the good people. And Chris was the best partner I ever had. And uh, we we had no money. Each of us had about a 1,000 US dollars people at that time. And we put our, all our savings into starting what was to become Wilderness Safaris. It was called Okavanga Wilderness Safaris in those days. And what we learned is that when you got, don't have money, you've got to do things with extraordinary enthusiasm, with the best guides, but we also learned to partner with local communities. And it's only through partnership. You know, we couldn't buy land. We didn't have the cash for that. We couldn't uh, buy the best lodges and all this type of stuff. We just had nothing. So we partnered with local communities. And it was in that process of learning how to partner with local communities that we actually were able to grow the business because the communities which we partnered with wanted to have, first of all, jobs, they wanted training, and they needed cash. So we could lease a piece of land and we could pay for it as we earned it. So as opposed to having to put out huge amounts of cash for a piece of land, we were able to pay for it as we used it. And there were no blueprints in those days. You just had to go and trial and error. And yeah. what we worked out very quickly is that the fairest deals, which were fair for all stakeholders, were the ones which had longevity. And we had to make sure that whatever we dealt with anywhere within Southern Africa, when we were dealing with communities, we had to make sure that it was a fair deal for everybody. And communities had two things. They had land and they had exceptional people. But those people hadn't been trained. There was no hospitality schools in these far-off places. So, and most of those kids coming out through those villages had very little formal education. So we had to learn on-the-job training. And that started with the building of the little camps. And when you're building camps, you see the guys with the biggest smiles, and that's who we employed. 
And those are the folks who we brought up and we trained. So through sharing, through skills transfers, through enthusiasm, we were able to sort of by trial and error, work out what worked and really what was the more good you did, the more good came back to us. And we were able to grow this business from almost of very humble sort of backgrounds and, and uh, business acumen just through partnerships. And it's just that partnership, finding the right people, finding the positive people and partnering with local communities was the real what worked for us. Now, thank you for the, the introduction. And obviously, it was a, a massive success, and it really defined how you work as a safari um, travel business. But um, you now have 20 lodges. How is the current situation affecting that community-based uh, relationship, and how is it affecting you as a business now? Well, so we started a new business called Natural Selection. About three years formally ago, we, we launched it. Uh, we started behind the scenes five years ago, and it was based around communities, communities and conservation. That's it. And there is no shortcuts on this corona story. It is diabolical. We've raised say we've got 20 lodges, 18 are shut completely in mothballs, but we haven't laid off staff. We've got most of our people on short time. And there is only one solution, and you've got to have shareholders with deep pockets. And fortunately, in the third version, what we started, we've got shareholders who are in it for the long run. So we've had to make a decision that we're not going to have any revenue between, well, a few months back and May next year. And we also have to have all future deposits ring-fenced in an untouchable account, an escrow account of sorts. And the combination of shareholder injections, previous cash, and making sure that escrow accounts are sitting there with zero revenue. It's the only way we can get by is by shareholders putting in cash. And uh, there's no other way around it. I mean, if anybody thinks they can get through to May next year, which I think is when the first of glimmers will start to turn around, especially in Southern Africa, that that's the that's what we had to do. And without that, without shareholders putting money, um, we would go to the wall. What is the role of government now then? in your opinion? Well, governments are in a really tricky situation. They have been for a long time. If you go back to the sort of 80s and 90s when we started, you know, governments were funding a fair portion of park fees and park management costs and conservation costs. But as African populations have grown, so the spending priorities of governments have changed. You know, they've got health issues, they've got education, they've got housing and all these type of things. So what's happened in the sort of 90s, there was a very interesting study done where they found that tourism was the second most extractive industry in Africa. Our systems, our pollution was terrible. Our uh, ways of running electricity and creating electricity and all that was just appalling. But tourism is now swung from this extractive industry to being the only sustainable form of funding conservation and park management fees until Corona. So we've had this extraordinary change of tourism industry from this kind of almost destructive industry to now this positive contributing industry. Right. But now governments are in a situation where nobody's got cash. I mean, to how do we fund the parks to, to make sure that they are going to be around for future gener generations when you've got no revenue? Governments don't have the money. Now tourism industries don't have the revenue. And it's a real, real crisis. So in many parts of Southern Africa, the tourism companies have got together and they're making sure that food parcels are delivered to communities and all the rest of it. So there's a huge effort to make sure that we try and retain as many of our staff as possible in the industry in Southern Africa. And we also then contribute to the people in our neighboring villages who aren't in jobs to make sure they're getting food every single month so that they we, we alleviate the need for them to go and poach. But it's not an ideal situation because places like Kruger Park, there's three and a half million people around Kruger Park. All the people are living, living around the Serengeti, around the Mara, all these places you know, it's it's a diabolical situation, and we've got to find alternative ways now to make sure that tourism is not the only sole funder. And my gut feeling is that these are global assets, and the globe yeah. needs to start contributing to the cost of maintaining these things. And for instance, if you look at a map of Africa, you've seen that map. You've seen that map of Africa. And you, put, you put the U.S. in, you put India in, and you put. Europe in, and there's still lots of space left over. You know, we're a huge chunk of the globe, and we do so much of the sequestration of carbon into our soils. And 
Africa does this as a favor for the rest of the planet. We're cleaning up all the pollution for the rest of Africa, for the rest of the world in our soils here. But those soils will only hold reasonable amounts of carbon if they're in pristine condition. So part of the planet's contribution to the going forward of our magnificent wildlife, our biodiversity, and the conservation efforts has to be some kind of global sharing of this responsibility. We've learned, well, up until Corona, we knew that tourism could fund it. But now that we've got this hiccup, we need to find backup to tourism. So carbon sequestration, we need to get the red carbon credit story going again. We need to have some formal ways where the globe starts to contribute to some of the assets, which are global assets. Yes, they're in Africa, but they are global assets for all of mankind. Well, that, thank you. And, and let's look towards the future a bit then and what, the, what Africa has to offer for in way of travel. Who should or, or what should Africa travel focus on? What type of person? What's the the future and, and the opportunity for um, companies like yours? Well, I think we've got an extraordinary uh, opportunity. You know, as the world gets more and more populated, we, could, we have got the last sort of remnants of the Garden of Eden. And one of the things with the studies which are coming out now about Africa is that there's a, a very interesting study on the go right now it's got, uh, with the University of Bergen and Witwatersrand along the Southern Cape coastline. And they're working out that each and every single human being on this planet came from a small group of about 300 breeding human beings, breeding couples of human beings, should I say, who lived along the stretch of coastline. All of the rest of Homo sapiens, us, I'm not talking about Homo hobilis and Nalendi and all the rest of it. I'm talking about human beings, our direct ancestors about all of us, doesn't matter if you're Chinese, Mongolian, American, South American, European, whatever, we all came from the small band of human beings which lived along the southern coast of near Cape Town. And from that, we started to move out towards Africa. But the very first evidence of art, science, and technology is now being proven to have come from here around about 100,000 years ago. And that's a remarkable thing because it has always been thought that most of the art and technology sort of originated in Europe, but it's now proven it comes from here. And each and every single person on the planet came from Africa. Every single person on this planet has got African DNA inside them. And there's something about when you go through trauma, when you go through crises, one of the best ways to sort of recalibrate yourself is to go back to wild places. And there's one an extraordinary healing power of traveling to Africa. When you go to these wild places in Africa, you can feel over a period of days, you're, you start to shed all those stresses and all the rest of it, and you start to rediscover the real you. And that's because we all came from here, and the healing power of these magnificent wild areas is something which, if we lose them, there's going to be a what's what are what are the next generations going to experience if we use these magnificent wildlife areas? We have to preserve them, we have to protect them, and we have to make sure that the people who live closest to them are becoming the prime benefiters of those wild areas. Because while human beings around the planet can be you, they can use these wild areas for their own private healing and for their own private enjoyment, we need to make sure that the tourism recipe is now changing dramatically. And we need to use the corona crisis to ensure that a lot more people who are living around our wildlife areas are now becoming the prime owners of the assets. And the people who view these magnificent areas, they need to start becoming into the boardroom of the tourism and wildlife industries as opposed to being the people on the periphery. So we've got an extraordinary opportunity, but we need the globe to come together. We need the world to come together. And things like the European Union laws and the UK travel laws are so draconian and against what's happening in Africa. At the moment, a person, all these people who booked the safaris this year, you know, they've got, all got their money back. All the money which is supposed to come to Africa to pay for the park fees, to pay for conservation, is back sitting in some of the wealthiest people on the planet. And the people at the coalface have got nothing. We have to have a dramatic change to the way the world views travel laws to Africa. When we, some of our concessions, one of our concessions, I'll give you an example. We pay 360,000 US dollars on the 1st of January. It's paid. Yet we don't, have, all the bookings through this year, we don't have one cent contribution because the EU and 
UK travel laws are so draconian. These type of things we've got to look at, we've got to put together a process so that Africa can share the burden. We're not asking the world to take all the burden, but to share the burden with the planet. And all we want is fairness. We don't want to have this one-sided draconian situation. We want situations where our wildlife areas are viewed as an asset, as we said earlier. It is, I mean, what you're implying there is obviously we all need to sort of look at Africa as the, the heart of where it all began. And, and, and we all have a responsibility in that, in a world that's becoming more and more um, fragmented and perhaps protected, uh, protectionism taking place. This is hugely um, transformational. Now, if I were to say to you, you're promoting travel now. You're urging the travel dollar to, to Africa. But this, this might be counterproductive to, to sustainability. You know, that you're trying to get more and more people to come to Africa. So what would you say, you know, how can you help? How can I help to, to, to with African travel? So one of the first things is, you know, people often say, yeah, what? How can I become a great conservationist? And I say the very first thing is book your holiday to go to Africa. Number one, because when you book a holiday to Africa, you are sustaining jobs. You are making sure that revenue goes into the systems of the different countries to make sure that the fiscus can appreciate wildlife. You're making sure that by traveling to Africa, there's park fees being paid, there's concession fees paid, all built into the cost of your, your holiday. So I think the first thing, Book a holiday to Africa. And by booking a holiday, you're going to become the best conservationist on the planet. If you cannot go, then I'm urging that, that start thinking of some kind of donations to parties. There's a lot of really good NGOs operating in Africa, which are desperate for money to, to see through this particular period. I would say that, you know, there's a whole lot of movement out there for flight chaining. Folks, we've got to just forget about flight chaining when it comes to Africa. You know, if you think about the emissions of an aeroplane, these new efficient aeroplanes out there, your emissions are minuscule compared to the good you do by traveling to Africa. So we've got to get rid of this flight chaining narrative. It must be off the dinner table. If you want to go from Paris to Barcelona, yes, hop on a train. But when it comes to Africa, we have to have long-haul flights. We have to make this part of the narrative. And we cannot have this flight chaining story disrupting and taking away the good that tourism does to our wildlife areas in maintaining these wildlife areas. And, you know, what I think is going to happen is that we've got a situation in the next while, once international borders open up and flights again, many of the older folks won't travel. And I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for young people who don't normally have the budget to travel to Africa because now – in the sort of going forward, once borders open up, you'll get the very best prices ever because everybody is just going to be trying to get some cash flow into the system to make sure that we can keep the wheels turning. I mean, a lot of the prices which we're hearing about for next year are going to be below cost. Purely we want people in the system to get the wheels turning again. We've got to start generating. So it's an opportunity for people who don't have the budget. Come and book a safari. The adventurer. The, absolutely this is the time and this then opens up um a wider area of africa for for tourism you know not just the typical the more the more wild the more adventurous absolutely well look colin i could chat to you all day but unfortunately i think our time is coming to an end i want to say thank you for joining us and thank you for oh, having yeah. 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 <laughs> cheers everybody it is definitely uh sundowner time and i want to thank colin and 